All right, thanks, Karim, uh, and thanks, VRTO, for uh, um, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce myself uh, as uh, I'm a professor at York University in Toronto, and I run a research lab called the Alice Lab, uh, focused on computational world making. Uh, and I'm also uh, an artist working together um, with Dr. Haraji from OCAD University, uh, producing um, a series of works which we call Artificial Natures, uh, which we've actually been working together on since 2007. The Alice Lab, so I'm going to just introduce some things in the computational world making uh, area uh, as they pertain to VR. Um, and uh, yeah, and the Alice Lab, which is a site of several different research projects supplying a deep commitment to the open endedness of computation as an art material toward technologies of biomorphic intelligence within immersive mixed realities. Um, this Interdisciplinary research creation builds upon a vision of VR uh, taken from VR's pine, uh, you know, godfather, Sharon Lanier, uh, as a medium of collective improvisation or collective improvisation of reality. So we're focused on uh, what we call endogenous worlds that are constructed from within, inactive using our whole bodies and populated by more responsive, curious, playful behaviors to share a different conception of the cohabitation of human and artificial beings. So I'll try and contextualize all of that with some uh, pictures of where I'm coming from, uh, some of the projects that, that, that we've worked on um, from you know, pre-Oculus days of VR up to the present, and also some thoughts of where we might be headed. Uh, so this is where my own VR journey began 15 years ago, and, and it's where I spent most of my uh, time doing a PhD. Uh, I came into this place uh, with a focus on electronic music and a background in web design, math, and philosophy. Uh, and Joanne um, couture Moron, the director of the Allosphere, uh, uh, considered this space as, a, as, as both a musical and a scientific instrument, and that idea resonated very deeply with me. So I, I, yeah. So even though this is where the allosphere is, actually, I spent most of my time in here, which is a little bit sad. Um, it's a spherical theater-like pavilion of uh, opaque uh, metal material suspended in a three-story near anechoic cube in the California Nano System Institute at UC Santa Barbara. It's used to project virtual environments of stereoscopic uh, imagery and spatialized sound. Um, it has this bridge through the middle of it uh, where you stand um, immersed in the sphere, a little bit like a Cerebro from the X-Men, surrounded by 26 stereoscopic projectors, 56 loudspeakers. Um, and one thing I learned very early working in this space is how painful it is to stop, edit, debug, redeploy, reload a world that's uh, being distributed on the system like that. Live editing, and especially collaborative editing with many of us working together in the same space, is another very musical influence that has come back again and again, and is one of the reasons why we never used a game engine for this kind of space. I'll talk a little bit more about that and then not get too techy, but believe me, VR headset warping is child's play com compared to this kind of mess. You know, all of these projectors projected onto curved objects that are not even regular curves. They're off-axis, weird curves. It's, it's not even a perfect sphere. It's slightly elongated. It was very complicated. Um, I used a genetic algorithm to solve the distortion. I kind of built a, a, a Raycast world example to quickly simulate whether the projection is working. This is the real thing, so it worked. Um, the next thing, uh, the, the next project we worked on in there, actually the inaugural project for the Allosphere was this piece called the um, Allobrain. And this originated in a poetic idea from an architect called Marcus Novak, um, asking us to explore a virtual architecture derived from fMRI snapshots of his own brain while he was experiencing a work that he considered beautiful. It was designed to be indicative, communicate the potential of this um, instrument, but it also served as a prototype, driving the software infrastructure and working methods in the atmosphere. As I said, this working method of being able to live edit as much as possible pushed it towards using um, a software called MaxMSP. 
as some of you might know about it. Um, it's a, it's a node-based uh, programming language that originated in uh, computer music um, history. And in the process of um, doing this, uh, we ended up building uh, a library of different tools for spatializing audio, for building multiple agents working in a space, and uh, also working with other uh, technologies and devices like connects and uh, markers and all kinds of things. And ended up getting used in a bunch of different pedagogical courses um, and uh, uh, many, many other artworks outside of the lab as well. And also in the process of this, I kind of ended up working for the people who made Max, uh, and through my PhD got focused on building a uh, runtime code generator and JIT compiler for Max uh, that would allow people to develop um, sonic algorithms that could run uh, very, very efficiently, but still kind of be uh, recompiled at every single edit. And I'll come back to this in a, in a, in a later slide. Also ended up developing uh, a spatializer for WorldViz that some of you might know about as well. Back to the Alisphere. Um, here's another project. This is the kind of projects that we were usually being asked to do. And here there was, um, I mean, it was a great project. You know, you got, you got to fly through uh, the internals of uh, the human body in order to visualize how a nanomedicine drug delivery, um, like anti-cancer uh, drug delivery mechanism might work. The problem generally was this getting into the collaboration uh, too late too late or too early of a stage. So it was too late for us to really contribute anything uh, meaningful beyond a, a visualization uh, of an idea that was already made. Uh, or in other projects, it was too early for us to, to, to build something because the idea was too nebulous. But anyway, we got our fantastic voyage down in testing. It was popular. Um, Again, Marcos Novak asked us to think about with a, with, a, with a tool like this and with a medium like this, you have to think what makes a world into a world or what would computational world making be? And this really kind of set off the, the direction that I've been following since then. Um, I thought of experiences that are rich and immersive, sonic, visual, and other modalities, environments that we can co-inhabit, that are populated by autonomous beings that, with which we can participate. And here the key idea is this, um, second, this notion of second order computing and applying second order computing to the space that's all around us and between us. What is second order computing? Basically, the thing that makes the computer different from other machines is that it is a machine that can become other machines. It's a machine that can change its mechanisms, that can change itself uh, even while it's running. It's a thing that allows us to, to, to load libraries or operating systems and software and so on. But it also means that we can create immensely open-ended and generative worlds uh, if we can only just figure out how to make them survive. Um, so this led to the birth of this collaboration with uh, Dr. Haraji, uh, creating what we considered uh, artificial nature. So taking this plasticity of computation and this uh, the inspiration of the complexity of nature and uh, putting those together into uh, immersive and deeply responsive environments. And so this is one of the, one of the early works that we made, uh, exhibited uh, inside of the Allosphere. It's really hard to convey uh, the scale, but think of, if you've seen a half dome, this is, or a full dome, well, this is like two full domes. Um, and uh, yeah, so we started producing these works. It wasn't just in the Allosphere. We also, we were taking them out and we were exhibiting them in different formats uh, in uh, different places. Um, I'll, I'll, and, and the more we worked, the more we developed um, the, the concept of what artificial nature uh, was. Um, and I'm just going to read a little description because it's better than me just muffling. Uh, the invitation is to become part of an alien ecosystem rich in networks of complex feedback, but not as its central subject. Although artificial natures are computational, we draw our inspiration from a sense of open-ended continuation and the aesthetic integration of playful wonder, attention of the unfamiliar, recalled from childhood explorations in nature. 
By giving life to mixed reality, we're anticipating futures inevitably saturated in interconnected computational media. But we believe that computation is not intrinsically utilitarian, nor is it necessarily in opposition to nature. We can see it instead as a material means to plunge even more deeply into what nature is and find our place within it. So, artificial nature spring from an inherent curiosity and aesthetic survival instinct to narrate alternate worlds in superposition to us as a reminder that although the imaginable is greater than the known, the real is greater and weirder still. And uh, since 2007, we've, uh, we've had like 40 or 50 exhibits at different um, uh, locations uh, around the world. And, uh, various recognitions. I, I'm going to introduce um, just three of the works uh, that I, I think have a little bit more, um, they speak uh, specific things to VR, uh, but hopefully this gives you a picture of uh, the bigger arc that they're part of. So the first one is Endless Current. And yes, of course, after working in the Allosphere, of course, we dove into using HDMI, HMDs as soon as, um, you know, as soon as the Oculus DK1 came. Um, we had some concerns here about uh, disembodiment of, um, of a pure headset, so we, we started working with uh, Kinect and other kinds of tracking to, to bring our bodies uh, back into the virtual space and be able to interact with the environment. And um, yeah, we're deeply inspired by the organizations and structures of nature uh, beyond and below the human scale. So here, the artificial creatures that you're uh, the, the, that are co-inhabiting the space with you, they subsist within a simulated uh, 3D fluid environment that is constrained by an amorphous landscape reminiscent of underwater or maybe macroscopic spaces. Um, we're committed to immersion into complex dynamic processes inspired by nature's example, but different to it, as something that we've never been able to experience before, as if walking into an unknown forest. It means making worlds with depths of discoverable kinds where every perceivable form has got multiple real functions and relations with other parts of the system, and that nothing in this world is static, there's nothing pre-baked, and there's no surface effects. That means everything you see has dynamic ontological relationships, including you. So in, in, in here, for example, every creature can add currents to the fluid flow, and the fluid flow is going to be pushing every creature around, including you. If you navigate around faster, you, you'll start creating fast currents that will create turbulence in the space. Uh, or if you're standing still and another creature comes past you, it will push you as well. But more than that. So just as you see the wind by how it moves the leaves, here you see the simulated fluid by how it's moving the particles that are suspended in it. This world is infinitely explorable. Its architecture is continually evolving, shaping and being eroded by the fluid currents. Um, and it's possible to watch the organisms mature from eggs into fully developed creatures. You can see, uh, see how they're eating the particles. The particles are not like surface um, VFX, there each one uh, persists uh, through time, changing form, changing shape as it gains energy in different ways. You can even watch them as they're being digested inside of one creature or, or ejected uh, back into the environment. Um, yeah. So there's a kind of a simple diagram of the network relations of um, what we're seeing right now. Uh, so it's had many uh, exhibitions. It's, um, it's taken part in a few VR film and games oriented uh, events and organizations. Um, it was featured on Viport at one point, which was nice. Um, it's also uh, been uh, exhibited in large scale uh, formats, uh, including at uh, uh, domes. This is the digital dome at the American Indian Art Institute in Santa Fe. The next piece I wanted to talk about is called Inhabitat. Um, this exhibit a children's science museum uh, and was visited by something like 65,000 visitors. Um, and it has a world that is engaged through three distinct ways to see with other eyes. So there's the, uh, a physical sculpture covered in sand that you, um, you can interact with as a macro scale, super personal perspective. Um, there's a meso scale perspective projected on the wall, which is a, a view for the eyes of one of the creatures inhabited in the space. And then there's a micro scale perspective in VR um, 
where you are shrunk down to 25 times smaller than normal size and you occupy uh, one of the points in the middle of this mountain sculpture. Uh, in this piece, we use projections and, 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 and tracking so you can see creatures crawl onto your hands and you can lift them up and move them around. Um, and uh, your, your hands or your body is being tracked as these giant um, shadow figures uh, that when you're in, in VR, you see them towering over you. Um, and that your shadows, again, they have a role in the space. They'll uh, eliminate the, uh, the, the lichen that's growing underneath, and then it will grow back uh, after you've gone. Uh, so these combined perspectives led to some interest in emergent uh, playful behaviors in visitors. In particular, people figured out that if you stand still for long enough, then the system will start to think that you are part of the mountain. And then if you're underneath where the VR person is, that, that they'll, they'll be lifted up and then you move away and they fall back down. So people like to play with that. Uh, when we prepared this installation, we couldn't actually go to the museum uh, as it was being newly constructed. Uh, so we had to develop the piece remotely uh, from here in Toronto. So we used VR to pre uh the exhibition uh, from floor plans, uh, which is really effective. We've been using that again since then. Uh, the last work I want to talk about um, from Artificial Nature is this piece called Conservation of Shadows. Um, this is generally, we're excited by the potential of VR and XR as a, as a way to bind virtual spaces, spaces to physical places in both functional and contextual ways. So it's, although VR can be viewed pretty much, you know, anywhere, it doesn't matter where you are when you're uh, when you're in VR and when you're in VR, you feel like you've gone somewhere else, then there's a, there's a weakness in tying the piece to the place of an exhibition in particular. Um, so rather than uh, presenting virtuality as, a, as an escapism to an independent world, uh, we want to think about how we could use it to connect deeply to one particular place, root it in a site-specific ground, uh, perhaps uh, revealing some possibilities uh, that couldn't otherwise be shown of what's uh, being present. So it's not just being there, but being there. Um, and so we were thinking about this as we thought about this venue um, called Sema Chango, which is an extension of the Seoul Museum of Art on the former grounds of what used to be a center for disease control. So a site of uh, storage of um, uh, dangerous uh, elements and also animal experimentation. Um, as a historical building, it had this great balance between order and disorder, but also this like weird charged history. Uh, and we imagined um, unknown creatures growing fond of the wet texture of the old wood and the fragrance of the sun, sun smearing between the cracks and the quietness of the space. And so to let them live, we extended the senses mixed realities by surrounding the space by these um, softly ringing bells and the crunch of salt under your feet. Um, uh, these bells vary in intensity and create this kind of varied sonic experience uh, whenever the creatures um, that you can't see uh, go close to them. Uh, another heart of the piece is this physicality of shadows as a liminal bridge suspended between the physical and the virtual space, uh, between mathematical and mythological senses. Sorry. Uh, the floor of this room is laden with a carpet of salt. The visitors feel the grain shifting and crunching under their feet with each step as they progress further into the environment. We all have shadows and we share them with the creatures. And the people who are in VR, they also haven't left this place. They haven't lost their bodies or their shadows. They're also uh, still in there. When you put on the VR headset, um, you take on an, an alternate perspective, you see the world in superposition to us, and what first appeared as flat shadows uh, turn out to be these uh, amorphous creatures that are um, moving around us and responding to our movements and gestures. And you can also sense the shadow volumes of other people who are in the space as they obscure the creatures. And um, on this visualization here, we've rendered them with a wire mesh, but in the exhibition, it, they were just completely black. So you just feel like you can sense that there's this moving shadow near you and, and, and moving around you. It's a bit like um, knowing someone's in a dark room with you. So those are some artificial natures. I wanted to talk um, very quickly. I know I'm kind of running out of time, but I'm gonna, I wanted to talk very quickly about 
how these feed back into things that are happening in the Alice Lab now um, and uh, where they might be going. So again, in addition to artificial natures, the lab applies this deep commitment to the open-endedness of, uh, open of computation, um, a way to co-create immersive whale worlds, ideally from within the worlds themselves. So I mentioned already, it's, it, it, it requires a different way of thinking about computation, not just as a tool for solving a problem or a machine for a given task, but um, that, that miss, somehow that misses this, util, this um, capacity of computation to continue and, and interactively rewrite itself into being something else. Um, this characteristic which it shares with nature, in fact. And so in many ways, uh, the goal is to apply this, what we, we've been calling second order quality of computing to the space that's all around us. So one thread of this is going into generative uh, autonomy and artificial intelligence. Uh, so in the artificial natures, the creatures use a form of genetic programming or grammatical encoding to generate unique programs for each creature. And they're adapting those programs in response to the environment that they're living in. And again, using the thing that I did many years ago, using the just-in-time compilation to ensure that we can have thousands of these creatures uh, being born uh, every few seconds. Um, there's also, in contrast to common approaches to genetic programming and machine learning, it's not like they're solving a pre-given problem. They're solving the problem of how to just make a living in a world to which there's no fixed answer and there's no final end. Um, so it's an open-ended and creative approach. Uh, we're also using neural networks uh, in a similar way. Here, dynamic both in their weights and their structure. And we've been playing around with populations in this work. We've been playing around with populations that um, are constantly singing their neural networks to each other. And if they like what they hear, they'll adopt the neural network of their neighbor, possibly mutating it slightly. So it's a mixture between uh, uh, you know, rewriting the neural network structurally and genetic programming. And you can see um, through these color waves how uh, different ideas or different umwelts or different ways of seeing the world are kind of spreading through the population as a whole. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a way of thinking about the open-endedness of computation as uh, an opportunity for humans. Uh, so th this is a, uh, an example of uh, live coding. It's a practice that emerged from uh, electronic music uh, in which people write, write the music by writing a program, quite often projecting the program that they're writing uh, during the performance. And um, inevitably, uh, we wanted to bring this kind of live coding to immersive worlds. Uh, we tried doing it in 2013 in the, the Allosphere, and it worked. We were building uh, and collaboratively coding uh, immersive worlds. But as you can see from the photo, the problem is you're all just staring at the laptop all the time. You're staring at text. And really, text-based interfaces just don't work that well for being fully immersed in the world. So I started thinking about node-based programming like maps again. Uh, from within VR. Uh, later, I found out about things that were happening uh, at VPL with Jérôme Lanier um, in the 80s, developing node-based programming environments. Um, they made one called Body Electric, blending high-level incremental compilers uh, with data flow. So again, uh, and Lanier in his book is name-checking both Max and the Allosphere, so I feel like I'm on the right path. Um, as he puts it, making VR sat at a desktop is like trying to learn a foreign language from a book instead of going there. Um, so with this inspiration, uh, we built a project uh, in the lab called Mishmash. It's a, a prototype and it's inspired by electronic music and modular synthesizers um, as a way to start exploring what it means to live code a world around you uh, using uh, visual patching. And in this case, what you're visually patching is a sound synthesis algorithm. Um, but the path is to, um, that we're expecting this to work forward to building uh, the entire world. Um, yeah, there's a little uh, video clip here. So the server, there's a server that's managing conflicts in global history between edits from different users. It's working telematically. 
um, using operational transforms or a variation of operational transforms. Um, we coded this in a mixture of Node.js and OpenGL and GLSL um, and uh, using metaprogramming uh, uh, through Max for the actual sound prediction. There's some interesting things that we learned in here. So one uh, is uh, the realization that any knob can be a jack. So you can plug a cable into a knob and then whatever signal is on the cable is going to start turning that knob for you, uh, which again is very much in the spirit of Lanius phenotropics. Um, also that signals are very fuzzy types, un unlike um, normal things in computing that are very strictly typed. So uh, a clock ramp could be an LFO or an envelope, a logic test could s um, detect ch significant changes rather than precise values. And this makes things a lot more interoperable, uh, promoting happy accidents and exploratory creativity, and also reducing the chance of you making a crash. It's practically, you cannot make a syntax error in this kind of environment. So, it also led to us thinking about the desire for forking worlds in place or stepping into sub-modules as sub-worlds uh, and bringing things back. Um, right now, we're working on a collaborative platform in collaboration with some colleagues at OCADU using WebXR to develop and live code worlds telematically using WebXR and Node.js, um, kind of extending this idea of live coding and live patching the environment um, and uh, finding the web to be far preferable than the kind of app store uh, environment for this kind of work for live updates and collaborative uh, replacement. It's a really exciting time to be doing this kind of stuff. Very quickly, uh, a couple of um, other doctoral student projects uh, in the lab. Um, Luminiferous Funeral, Funeral is a, a VR game artwork with a physical sensory perception installation focusing on the exploration of the invisible erosion of climate change and the environmental breakdown by offering audiences an opportunity to dialogue with nature and focusing participants on inner communication with oneself about the essential nature of light, life and death. So using data to curation of machine learning to, for art as activism to appeal to humanity's climate crisis denial. And in the process of this, uh, Sarah Volmer, one of the students on this project, has been developing uh, custom haptic technology and kinesthetic experience to expose multiple body-centric aspects of sensory stimulation. So here, a set of custom tactile gloves that she's developing this summer uh, are being used to um, uh, to, to interact and draw traces in space. And she's motivated by minimalist design, low-cost tinkering, soft robotics, flexible batteries, washable wearables to enhance tactile sensations and pressure focus on the hands and fingertips. And uh, this integrates with a longer arc of research in the lab focusing on gesture as one of the core differences between discrete desktop interfaces and the embodied immersive interfaces uh, of VR. Um, and I personally, I think that this extends things that were done much earlier uh, in kind of the early exploration of interactivity on 2D canvases by people like John Maida and uh, Golan Leonard. Finally, um, After Dan Graham is a piece uh, by um, David Han from the lab and his collaborator Aidan Waite. Uh, as a recreation of uh, a piece, uh, Dan Graham's Time Delay Room. And the best way, the simplest way to describe it is uh, taking a kinematic model of the VR participant and sticking it through a delay pedal. So every eight seconds, a copy of you appears in the space and starts repeating every movement that you've made uh, until the space completely fills up um, uh, with uh, copies of yourself. and. It's a, a really interesting uh, use of VR to explore this relationship between subject and object. And I know that I've gone way over time, so uh, I apologize for that, but um, I hope there was a lot of, uh, or at least something interesting uh, in there that might provoke some uh, good questions. So thank you. Round of applause. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Graham, uh, you did not go over time, although I can feel that you have to often apologize for that, mostly <laughs> because you have nothing going on in VR, clearly. Um, right. So I'm going to ask you a few <laughs> questions, and I'm going to field some questions. And uh, I guess my first question to you is, like, what's it like to just be starting out in immersive media? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> what do you actually... So you're at York University right now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, are you... 
researching? Are you teaching both? Uh, what kind of students do you have? Both. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm a regular professor, but I also hold uh, what's called a Canada Research Chair position, uh, which means that I have a reduced teaching load and more time spent um, uh, conducting research and uh, directing graduate students. And I run and the Alice Lab. <laughs> And the, the students are, um, the students have been from many, many different kinds of programs uh, at the university. Uh, I mainly teach in a program called Digital Media, which is, uh, um, in plain terms, is collaboration between a faculty of art and a faculty of um, computer science and engineering. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, there are... Uh, also, students uh, like David Han was from the, the film program. Uh, Michael Blumbo was originally from theater and performance, but now digital media. Uh, yeah, so the, the students coming from many different directions. David Han's piece uh, uh, before Dan Graham mm. through his uh, vehicle friend generator was the winner of the Five R's Festival um, People's Choice for Interactive media and that year yeah. we had some really extraordinary pieces um, about the life of a tree um, and we had I think Mary Lynn Oliver's piece where she had scanned herself in an MRI and you could walk through it but in the mm -hmm. end the uh, what people really really liked was being able to watch yeah. themselves on an eight second delay and just yeah. had this it, unstoppable delight at observing their own gait patterns and their own head movements and recognizing their significant others. And there's something about that. Is it abject yeah. narcissism or is it the fact that we don't get enough <laughs> feedback about ourselves in, in the normal day? I don't know. I'm, I, I think it has something. So I, I, have, a, I have a young daughter and um, ha having a kid has taught me to appreciate uh, play a lot more. Uh, and to appreciate the, the mechanical elements of play, the mechanical elements of humor and the mechanical elements of play. And um, mechanical makes it sound really bad, but actually they're, they're, they're really juicy. They're really um, productive. There are so many simple things. A, a delay, I mean, even in music, a, a simple delay can make things get really interesting. You can play with a copy of yourself. You can play with a history of yourself. Um, and it's not... Narcissism is it's a, a it's a it's a kind of plane of discovery, uh, a way to to see things in in a, in a different pattern. And I think most um, uh, certainly for me, most of the interesting things about interactive technology and interactive art have to do with that. They have to do with this uh, uh, discovery of new spaces through relatively simple mechanisms. VR itself is a really simple mechanism, right? The, the visual component of VR uh, is simply, um, you know, uh, being able to pre present a viewpoint quickly enough uh, that it matches what your eye is expecting to see. So you then take it for real. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a ridiculously simple um, uh, technique, but what it makes possible is, is, is so remarkable. It means every, every part of the environment around you can now be, uh, uh, at least visually, replaced with something completely different, completely dynamic. What are your goals now, after all of this work, given the state of the world? I um, <laughs> was reflecting on this last night and thinking, why are we doing all of this? Uh, I was reading about the, the basic extinction of the great white rhino and mm. about the fact that lakes are losing all of their oxygen due to climate um, change. Mm. And just thinking, like, what do we... Oh, and the other thing I was reading about to make my morning pleasant was about how the sort of global supply chains have collapsed through both the pandemic and other complexities and grocery mm. store shelves and supply shelves and medical equipment and so on are, are just running out. And, and mm. the, the, the fragile nature of these supply lines are collapsing. And, and this assumption that we will always just be able to go to the store and get exactly what we need, let alone in the right color, um, mm. is a sort of entitlement that we are going to have a reckoning with. 
Mm. And I was thinking, you know, having these social, what we're doing is we're running a social experiment to find a way to create more embodied instant communication with each other that is a visual, spatial um, method uh, that will work as a shorthand when we don't have time for words and opinions and we just have to demonstrate something or um, be in the center of, of the data, right, to transform ourselves or just to be able to connect um, in meaningful ways as these things change. Uh, let, I, I just want to let you comment on that. I feel like there's uh, an important core in your work um, that's concerned with us and the ecology that we're facing uh, and and how do you think this is going to play out? I mean, how do you, how is this going to trickle out to the to the larger picture? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I was I would, uh, I was having a a little bit of cognitive distance between what you were saying and the your avatar. Um, it's very very you know blank. The pro the the that we don't have time to, I, I forget the words you exactly said, but that we don't have time to, uh, um, to, to process, or we don't have time to, to, to pay attention to things is yeah. a, is a problem. Um, and I, I don't really understand why we don't have time. It's not like there's less time than there was before. Right. Um, it's, it's purely through our choices or our inability to manage our, uh, kind of uh, a, a, a attention uh, attractions. Um, I have hope. Uh, I, I found something that has been coming back to me again and again and again. And this also goes back to a time when I was, when I was a PhD student. We had a professor come and give a talk and um, he'd been very successful building a ragdoll model for video games. Uh, and he said something like, um, Guys, don't don't make your life complicated. Just find the low hanging fruit. Go for that. You'll be you'll be fine. You'll be rich. And I, I there was something so wrong about that statement for me. Um, it the the focus on the low hanging fruit, the focus on the quick uh, solution or the simple solution or the 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 most efficient solution is the problem. We're having supply problems because of just in time delivery systems that just don't work right. Right. when something goes wrong. We have it here in Canada, we had nobody who was able to manufacture PPE at all. We were completely dependent. It, 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 it shocked me. Like it's absurd that there's a country that cannot produce its own PPE. Um, What's PPE? Uh, personal protective equipment. So masks. Thank you. Um, so I, but at the same time, I don't think that, like I said, I don't think the technology is necessarily um, uh, the the problem here. But the, the the way that we've been singularly focused on the quantitative measurement and the the, the low hanging fruit is and has been uh, a severe problem. Um, in going back to the atmosphere, like the idea of using this as an environment to explore data. Uh, was compelling for us because you're able to see a larger amount and you're able to respond to that larger amount using your full sensory motor loop, which is a lot better than looking at a graph um, in terms of being able to see things that hadn't been seen before. But in terms of a quick solution, it, we just couldn't, break that through to, to to many of the researchers that we were that we were talking to and they couldn't they couldn't see that connection there so that gap i think is the gap that um at least people like me need to figure out to convince everyone to to slow down and go deep yeah i like it. that idea about time amelia winger bearskin uh who spoke with us um in the physical vrto a couple of years ago Mm. She she talked about the time is just an illusion, which of course it is, uh, um, uh, and that that this concern that we're always running out of time is is the core of the problem. That and so you align mm. with her in a lot of ways on that. Um, and I I uh, refer people back to her talk at VRTO with uh, 
myself and Douglas Rushkoff to see the expression on his face, the epiphany that he had. Because when I invited Douglas Rushkoff, you know, this media theorist to mm -hmm. speak, he said, I, I don't think I can talk about VR. We don't have time to be th talking about VR. You know, the world is in trouble. We need team human. And I said, well, you can either be part of the conversation or not be part of the conversation. So I'll leave that up to you. Of course, these tools can also help us to explore different relationships with time mm -hmm. and entropy and rolling things back and looking at them from an alternate perspective or a different sort of causal pathway that could have happened. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to any of that in terms of your work? Um, yeah, I mean, it was at the heart of the conversation uh, with David when he was developing that After Done Grand piece, of course. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I had a fractured relationship with time, but I think since I was a kid, I still struggle with it. Um, mm. It's uh, interestingly, I'm 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 writing a book at the moment on uh, nothing to do with VR. It's a book about um, uh, writing audio synthesis algorithms. Um, but it everything in the book has started to turn around. Simply, it's all about time. It's all about uh, rates of speed and slowness, accumulations, and um, and and changes changes the difference of time and uh, i know that sounds a little pithy but um like in the math it really does work out that way as well i don't think it sounds um, pithy um carlo Rivelli's book the order of time is a really hmm. great distillation of this idea that time you know operates in bubbles and that it has different density yeah. and um velocities of course which is just sort of physics uh that you know but hmm. but then at the end this sort of beautiful passage on what music is and yeah. essentially, you know, he's saying that time only exists inside of our minds. Like the, our brain effectively processes entropy as this extrapolation of a point cloud. Like we live in a giant point cloud and what we're doing is walking through it and noticing entropy. And in our brains, that's processed in a linear fashion, which we call time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is of course, something you can demonstrate with these immersive tools um, if, if you can't quite sort of get outside of your anthropocentric view on how to process that notion that mm. time is just you walking across the floor and looking at it from, um, from different points of view. And then he talks about what music is. And music is our sort of data mapping of our emotional... It's, it's a way to, to express this concept this human well maybe animal um extrapolation of moving through the point cloud in a mm. lyrical way and i just think that notion is so beautiful like it changes the relationship to what music actually is doing and then when you start getting into the harmony of the spheres and you start getting into the frequencies and how they you know align with each other and, and their impacts and how we're distilling those down to the ones that feel good versus the ones that are dissonant and contrasting. And then there's a sort of cultural effect of that. Music uh, becomes quite a different thing altogether. It really does. And it's, uh, um, I, I, I really, I, I love the, the perspective of time and music of um, kind of uh, successively encircled presence of different duration rather than like there's a now and a past and a future, but there's more kind of, yeah, bubbles of compressed moments and bubbles of more extended moments. Um, and there's also this constant motion of, um, there's expectation and recognition and surprise, uh, which are uh, things, interestingly, those are things which are feeding into some of the approaches that we're looking at for the AI right now. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been an undercurrent through all of the, the work. In one of the pieces, um, we had a, a wall projection from a perspective of uh, a creature that was more of a vegetal um, component, the ecosystem. And so we wanted to present a different perspective of time uh, from, from that creature's uh, experience of the world because it literally was updated more slowly in the system. 
Um, so we used a kind of a slit scan uh, way to display things. So if you walk through the space, you would appear as just this tiny blip in its experience because you're too fast. Um, but if you move slowly or if you kind of hold still for a little while, then you'll kind of be stretched out and you'll have more of a presence uh, in the perspective and more of an impact uh, in the perspective of that creature. Um, yeah, in musical terms, I, there, there's a tendency, um, there's a tendency to think about uh, the uh, timelines, uh, which has become very present in uh, musical software and nonlinear editing um, suites and video editing as well, I guess, um, uh, which is a very different thing from the experience of time when you're performing music. And that experience of time while performing music, I think, is much closer to what we're um, aiming uh, aiming toward. And it's it, it's it's very much the the inspiration, the original inspiration for this thing of if you're going to edit the world, you can't stop it. It has to keep going. You have to edit it in place. It's like the music cannot stop. It it, it should not stop. You have to be able to work uh, within the bounds of what's already available. Um, and I think it's a really uh, you get, there's a flow state um, component to that. So it's a very rewarding experience, um, but it's also a very natural experience. I mean, it's, it's what every biological organism has to do. It has to replace every part of itself continually uh, without ever falling apart, which I think is magical. And if we could learn to actually do that ourselves a little bit better, then probably we wouldn't run out of PPE in, a, in an emergency. There's some comments in the Discord, I think. I'll read it to you. Um, Jose says that he loves the connection between tech nature and spirituality. The shadow piece resonated with him. You mentioned that machine learning uh, are solving a problem on how to survive in a world where there is no problem, more or less not having a purpose. As we mm. humans do, we must also find our purpose, and through purpose there is sentience. Would you say machines will ever get to sentience as well in the near future? I'm not entirely sure that we know what sentience is. Um, I don't see any reason why it's not possible. I'm not convinced that we would recognize it if it happened. Um, mm -hmm. This thing about um, having a purpose is an interesting question. You have a purpose when you play a game. Um, in almost all games, you have a purpose, you have a role. Uh, you have a purpose when you play a piece of music or you take part in a theater. Um, and the thing falls apart if you don't hold your purpose as well. Um, there's an element there of uh, kind of taking, taking a purpose seriously, even if that purpose doesn't have uh, an ultimate uh, end in terms of things like survival and so on. Um, so I think purpose can be over overemphasized a little bit in the meaning of life. Um, there was another thing I was going to say in response to that, though. I want to say it. Oh, um, creativity. There's an interesting thing about creativity. So we've had this um, habit of thinking of um, evolution through a lens of competition, uh, when in fact a lot of evolution is really not competitive at all. A lot of it is hugely accidental. Um, and uh, it turns out that when, um, when an ecosystem is put under intense pressure, it is less likely to be evolutionary creative. It's going to hunker down, essentially. And um, the same thing seems to be true of human creativity. We perform worse under pressure. Um, so if we can find ways to um, build systems that we can inhabit that give us space without pressure, um, uh, both human and artificial systems. You know, there are many examples of artificially intelligent uh, systems. Novelty search is a good example. Novelty search is a technique of AI where there is no goal. There is no fixed target to meet. They're the only measure of success is that you've done something that hasn't been done before. And simply using that measure can help you to um, kind of explore spaces or sol um, uh, like solve mazes or complete video games, whichever 
you know, environment this AI is living in uh, faster than something that is actually driven by a metric, like a score metric. I think that's fascinating, and I think it's really uh, indicative. So, I, you know, it's okay to not have a clear objective in a way. <laughs> yeah, I would also encourage people to read into the whole uh, object ontology, uh, object-oriented ontology movement, where you've got people like Graham Harmon, who talk about mm. um, the quantum relevance of objects and um, the, uh, tr attempting to understand the, the purpose of existence from a non-anthropocentric view. Uh, we always you know, we have this, I, this Cartesian idea of like, I think, therefore I am, but it's mm -hmm. such a anthropocentric notion to think that, mm -hmm. oh, if I don't see it, then it must not exist. You know, you put a paper exactly. bag on a cat's head and all of a sudden the universe never happened. So uh, this notion of object-oriented ontology or like, what's the point of being a rock and how does the rock see the thing? And can we even think about how a rock thinks because we can't think outside of thinking um, is a pretty fascinating topic. Mm -hmm. Of course, ontology is all about the study of the meaning of what the hell are we doing anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, Graham. I have to uh, wrap this up, but um, there are questions and comments for you in the Discord. Of course, I hope you'll be with us for the rest of the show, and I'm very yeah, glad to introduce your work to this audience. I appreciate your time. Yeah, th uh, um, thank you very much for the fascinating questions as well. It's really cool. I will stick around on the Discord and uh, uh, obviously be here all day.